if I told you there was an epidemic happening amongst young men with your son, your children? What if I told you that this epidemic is something engineered by the left? A way to soften our young men and boys. Forget boys being what they are, boys. No, you can't even say boys will be boys anymore. See, there is a systematic attempt to soften our young men and turn them into girls, self-proclaimed himbos, soy boys, even baby girls. I'm your host, Candice with a K, Bowens, and I would like to welcome my guest, Shucker Parlson, to the show. Shucker, you have a PhD from the Columbia Institute of Theological Medicine with a focus on men's genitals, specifically reproductive activity. Shucker, can you talk to us about what exactly is happening with these young boys? Well, Candace with a K, it's all very simple. What we are witnessing right now is an assault on masculinity. We are in World War Spermageddon. The left hates testosterone. They are doing everything in their power to turn men and boys into proud himbos willing to simp for the women in their lives. Simping? What, what exactly is that? That's a new slang term among the left. It means to show love and compassion to those you admire. It's sick. It's brainwashing. It infringes upon our constitutional rights. It sounds very dangerous. But as you say, the progressives tell you you're being dramatic, but you have actual evidence that men's testosterone levels are decreasing. Can you speak more about this? Exactly, Candace. For decades, we have been witnessing the fall of testosterone levels in men. I mean, it's a total collapse and no one is talking about it. In my very real documentary, The End of American Men, we, we researched how the left's attack on masculinity has infected the very fabric of our society. And we came away with indisputable evidence. Joe Biden is injecting our men with soy sauce. Here's a case study image. This soy sauce deteriorates the testosterone in a healthy human male and makes him feminine. It gives him empathy. It makes him care about other people. We need to return to the holy time of eating raw eggs and drinking nail smoothies. We need to reject the soy sauce agenda. Powerful words, Shucker. We'll hear more from our guests after this break. Their chest measurements rival Dolly Parton's. Their brains would embarrass a squid. They Bollyhoo maiden form undies do nude scenes and are widely popular with both girls and boys. They come in two varieties, greased and armed to the teeth or moosed and undressed to die for. They're bombshells with a Y chromosome. Bimbo be gone. Hollywood has blessed us with the himbo. So in order to understand why conservatives, folks on the right, and just some folks on the internet that are so worried about the state of masculinity have this impression, we need to explain what all these archetypes are. Understanding, of course, that people are not a monolith. All men are not the same thing. They come in many different shapes and sizes, forms, whatever. As you'll hear from some of the dudes throughout this video, uh, maybe some of this stuff is true, but eh, you know. It's almost like it's another right wing culture war issue. Yet we are the ones who get upset about things easily. Interesting. But himbo is actually officially in the dictionary with Merriam Webster defining himbos as attractive but vacuous men. They're sexy, they're silly, but they are not very smart like their relative, the bimbo. The kind of guy whose simple mindedness and simple nature is his appeal. Characters like Kronk from The Emperor's New Groove get cited a lot as himbos. Joey from Friends, I've never seen that show. It was just in the notes. Nate from Gossip Girl, Kristoff from Frozen, Mr. Magic Mike himself, Channing Tatum. Oh, oh, Channing. But Channing fits kind of in a baby girl. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Oh, Channing. Oh. Raina was noting that himbos are kind of like this antidote to the quote, toxic nerd culture, where you have this 
archetype of guys that are really smart but can't get girls and resent them for it and talk down to them and think that they're stupid because they're so smart and it's one way to level yourself above someone that you think is rejecting you by making yourself feel better, you know, you, you know. And although all of this could be seen kind of insulting, calling someone, oh, hot but dumb, you're so pretty. It's actually kind of a positive. It seems like most people just find hippos pleasant, you know, uncomplicated to be around. They're just chilling. They're just nice. <gasps> the peasant at the diner. You didn't pay his check. It's the peasant who I saw leaving the city who disappeared into the crowd with Cusco in the back of his cart. <gasps> he must have taken him back to his village, so if we find the village, we find him, and if we find him, we find Cusco. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. This one goes out to you, Kronk! Oh. I didn't even have a crush on Kronk growing up. Like, you know how you have a crush on some childhood characters? I wasn't attracted to Kronk, but I just wanted to hold him. Oh, I can take care of you, Kronk. Oh, oh, okay, I'm done. Oh my God, I need to stop doing this. I'm not trying to infantilize men. I'm sorry, men, or if, if, you're, if you're still here, hey. I'm not trying to infantilize you. Some of you I just want to hold. And I hope that doesn't sound condescending. Getting back to the task at hand. Cyclopedia.pub cites that the first use of himbo was from 1988 in the new Patridge dictionary of slang and unconventional english it's specifically from an article titled the himbo all powerful and all beef it's the real man it was in all caps so that's why i was yelling in 1995 cnn reporter sherry sylvester interviewed hollywood actors about the term and <laughs> one of our favorite himbos said himself there's a great word, said actor Keanu Reeves. I love that. I read that and laughed my head off. Oh, Keanu! Stop! A lot of Keanu's characters could be seen as himbos. And there is, of course, this iconic magazine cover. I mean, it's right there. And I should mention that because of this sometimes melding of the roles people play and their personalities, it's why I was interchangeably saying Magic Mike and Channing Tatum as being a uh, himbo. Channing Tatum is a fully realized person. I don't know him. This is just the vibes. And he probably has many other vibes. But a lot of his characters play this sort of role. 21 Jump Street, all of the Magic Mike films, his breakout role in She's the Man. There's this himbo diagram that a himbo must possess at least three of these traits, beefy kind, stupid. <laughs> and Antonio was adding that actually another trait that the himbo has is one of being respectful to women. And we love that. Himbos also, as the term is evolving, maybe aren't necessarily stupid. They're gifted in other ways. Maybe they got street smarts, you know? Not everyone has to be book smart. It couldn't all be positive, y'all. Cause the next archetype we gotta talk about is the soy boy. Now this is a new pejorative to describe a unmanly man. Those aren't my words. But according to Terrence Real in I Don't Wanna Talk About It, previous iterations of soy boy have been pussy, sissy, or wimp. Can you think of a few other ones that people have used? Cause I could think of a few girly, pansy, rhymes with baguette. And Terrence Real is someone that I've talked about a lot on this channel, but this is from his other book, I Don't Wanna Talk About It, Overcoming the Secret Legacy of Male Depression. And he says that insults like this tend to infantilize and feminize boys and men, particularly those that dare to explore being maybe more vulnerable, more open. Those parts of themselves are levied against them as a form of quote, gender ridicule. And I did not know this before this episode, but apparently it's soy boy because it comes from this school of thought that soy has estrogen effects on hormones. Raina notes the science is not conclusive and more research needs to be done on soy and hormonal health. This basically means that a soy boy would be a man with elevated 
feminine hormones, you know, elevated estrogen, elevated girliness, if you will. And yeah, this is usually a term used by folks that are very, very, very online, um, on the far right, you know, aspect of things, or taken back by self-proclaimed soy boys. Everybody celebrating the fact that Andrew and Tristan got arrested looks like this. Why? They have lower testosterone. Oh, brother, get a load of these guys. They don't even like sex trafficking. How embarrassing. We have a backhanded, but still positive compliment in the himbo. We've got a more pejorative term in the soy boy. And then we've got the baby girl. This is my favorite. <laughs> And I know it's silly, so to me, this is all just fun, okay? Because according to Urban Dictionary, it's a term used towards fictional grown men who, quote, have the fandom in a loving chokehold, or from Know Your Meme. Baby girl is an internet slang term and term of endearment used to describe attractive or cute men, including fictional characters from various fandoms, in an infantilizing way. The exact metrics that make a baby girl are loosely defined, with online examples ranging from K-pop star Jimin and actor Pedro Pascal. What does it mean though, to be a baby girl? See, baby girl is a little girl coded, you know? Baby girl is a grown man, an adult, but he does his best and he just cares a lot and you just want to take care of him. You just want to hold him. Squeeze up, try a little tenderness. You know, you just want to care for him. Slates, I see why Amai recently actually did an episode about one of the internet's favorite baby girls, Mr. Kendall Roy from Succession. And having watched the show, I can confirm Kendall is baby girl, but he's like annoying to me. Honestly, I'm team Roman and I hated him the first episode, but Roman is baby girl that I just wanna pick up and hold. I just, mm. I also recently watched a video by Kayla Says that was just kind of trying to understand why Succession has such an interesting demographic fan base where you'd expect it to be a bunch of middle-aged white dudes who just love fantasizing about business deals, but there are a lot of young queer women and they thems that are just like, oh my God, I love this show and I love these baby girls, you know? And they point to the relatability of someone like Kendall trying so hard to get his father's approval, crying on his birthday. He just always fucks up. Kendall always fucks up. I, I did, I did try. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. I'm not a good person. Well, whatever, you're fine. I'm, I'm bad. Come on, lighten up, Glum Glum. Kendall, stop doing things. Stop doing things, baby girl. Oh, see, I get it now. But this positive yet feminine sort of attribute, this cognitive dissonance of looking at a grown ass adult man or even a character from Call of Duty named Ghost, looking at someone like that and being like, baby girl, is something that only the gender fluid queerdo weirdos could <laughs> come up with and it fits. But if you've noticed, we were talking a lot about fictional characters because a lot of this stems from stan culture, especially because a lot of these characters get analyzed and analyzed and analyzed to the deepest layers of whatever beyond what maybe even the writers had imagined. That breeds a lot of projections, you know? which breeds a lot of connecting to a character and understanding them as baby girl, because maybe there's some baby girl in all of us. With someone like Pedro Pascal, whose characters people see as baby girl, but as a person, people also project this baby girl fantasy onto him. There's this gentle masculinity that he has or appears to have that also contributes to wanting to protect him because he has this quiet softness, but also wants to protect others. And like I said, there's this projection. There's this, I see you because I get that. At least from my perspective, maybe not everyone feels that way, but archetypes like the himbo, soy boy, and soft boy weren't born out of nowhere. You know, things like this, whether they exist everywhere in real life or mostly online are a result of something. And it seems like these have become a result of a 
of, you know, 2010s feminism, the Me Too movement, lots more agency with women. It's like, what kind of men are we looking for in real life that gets reflected to us in the media in a way? And it makes me wonder, is this also just what people create and use these archetypes to go, hey, maybe if we had more people, more men like this, we wouldn't have to go through so many Me Too eras and whatnot, you know? We wouldn't have to have Me Too. Maybe if there was more talk about gentle masculinity and we showed it in these stereotypical characters with, with simplistic traits to make it easy for anyone to imprint their personality onto, maybe more men's is gonna start doing that. But you notice I was gonna be backlash. We gotta acknowledge the fact that a lot of the backlash towards these softer iterations of manliness or manhood, whether they're in the media, in real life, not, or both, come from other men. The majority of them. This is an absolving women. We'll get to it. I always do. The backlash typically comes from that and the right wing. And their ideal of feminizing men on the left, they really love to do that because femininity is a negative to them. Of course they love to do that. And if you say that, they say no, but if femininity is not on a woman, it is a negative. And even when it is on a woman, it's a negative. With these archetypes, don't really jive with them that much either. But even if folks on the right or other men online have this idea that we're losing men, masculinity is dying, it's withering out for all of these soft feminine versions, and folks on the left are coming up with these archetypes and stereotypes, whether in jest or just taking them seriously or not. Actual men, what do they have to say? And we're back with our special guest and expert, Shucker Parlson, talking about the state of masculinity and manhood in this country. Now, Shucker, some folks may be hearing all of this and thinking, you guys are being dramatic. You know, this isn't really a thing. Real men don't actually care about this. But as I understand it, real men do care about this. Can you explain the image that we're looking at on the screen? Yes, Candace. This is something that real men are making to fight back against the weaponization of feminism, to point out the hypocrisies of our post Me Too era. Look at the strong domineering presence of Rihanna in this image. Look at how she presents her pussy to the world while her husband <laughs> while her husband hides his cock in shame. Look at how he holds his child lovingly, assuming the position of a submissive female. Rihanna is leaning in a way that's scientifically proven to release more testosterone into the air. Because we know that we know. when you're slouching, more estrogen is being released. When you're hugging a baby, more estrogen is being released. These are just facts. And... It's so sad to see how many people are being brainwashed or bullied by the left into accepting these unnatural social orders. You can look it up. It's true. The fake news media wants to hide this from you, but it's true. This image is precisely what's wrong with our society. Rihanna and the liberal leaning left hate real men. Shucker, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Where can the folks find you in all of this important work that you're doing? Yes, Candace. All my socials are at Shuck the Left. You can find me at Big Cat News Mondays through Fridays at 10 p.m. or on my 10 part podcast, Spermageddon. The first three episodes are actually out today, and we discuss some solutions to our current testosterone crisis. I will definitely be checking that out, as I'm sure the audience at home will. Thank you so much for joining us, Shuck. You know, we weren't gonna talk about a video involving men and not talk about patriarchy. Huh? But why patriarchy? Because it is what all of us are conditioned through amongst other things. And with boys and men in particular, it shows itself in a very interesting way. And again, not all boys and men, they are not a monolith. But there are a lot of similarities and themes that show up. I like to distinguish between political and psychological patriarchy like Terrence Real does because political patriarchy is the systemic inequities that we see around us. Psychological patriarchy though is more that everyday stuff, the in the home stuff that you noticed between your parents perhaps. 
the stuff that you notice in your relationship dynamics or at school between boys and girls. Real talks about there being this imaginary line where feminine traits are on one side and masculine traits are on the other. And psychological patriarchy requires you to shoehorn yourself as much as possible to the side where the masculine traits are located to have these traits as parts of your personality. And again, not all men feel this pressure, but some men do. And a good portion of them do enough that we have a lot of books about it, so. Psychological patriarchy is a dance of contempt, a perverse form of connection that replaces true intimacy with complex, covert layers of dominance and submission, collusion and manipulation. It is the unacknowledged paradigm of relationships that has suffused Western civilization generation after generation, deforming both sexes and destroying the passionate bond between them. To end patriarchy, we must challenge both its psychological and its concrete manifestations in daily life. Psychological patriarchy affects so many aspects of your life because it is the patriarchy that lives in your brain. It's Foucault's panopticon. You're so used to being watched, surveilled, told how to act or behave, because a lot of us are growing up, what boys do, what girls do, what they're not supposed to do, what they are supposed to do, till you're able to surveil yourself and make sure that you adhere to these rules and regulations that you didn't make up, that your parents didn't, but you just decided to follow. And you know I love to talk about feelings, so how does this affect emotions? Real claims that the only emotion patriarchy rewards is anger. Bell Hooks has also said that the only two emotions men are allowed to feel are anger and indifference. And anger and indifference are two big emotions that manifest in a lot of different ways. And I'm not saying those are the only two emotions men have access to at all. Again, human beings, complicated, plethora of feelings. But what we're socially conditioned to believe we're allowed to quote unquote feel or not feel or when we're allowed to, as Dr. Mark Brackett talks about the display rules, when, where, and how you're allowed to express your emotions, if you're allowed to, depending on what body you're in, and what way you're supposed to be able to. I think some of you can relate to that. And for the men, do you think that there are certain emotions that you were not allowed to have or express as a child? The reality is that men are hurting and that the whole culture responds to them by saying, please do not tell us what you feel. If we cannot heal what we cannot feel, by supporting patriarchal culture that socializes men to deny feelings, we doom them to live in states of emotional numbness we construct a culture where male pain can have no voice, where male hurt cannot be named or healed. Patriarchy demands of men that they become and remain emotional cripples. Since it is a system that denies men full access to their freedom of will, it is difficult for any man of any class to rebel against patriarchy, to be disloyal to the patriarchal parent be that parent female or male. Remember how I said I was gonna to get to the ladies and the babies. <laughs> Men impose a lot of these stereotypical rigid rules and restrictions on each other and surveil each other accordingly. But the rest of us do it to men too. I've told y'all before that there have been times where I've been very frustrated dating cis straight men and asking them, yo, what is up? Like, just fucking open up, just talk to me, tell me what's up, be honest, blah, 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 blah. And then they're honest and I'm like, ah! you know? I cry or I'm like, no, I don't wanna hear this, you know? And I'm not saying that that's an all the time thing. I definitely respond very well and appreciate vulnerability a lot, but I would be lying if I said I hadn't done that to men in my life. If I hadn't gotten uncomfortable seeing a man be emotional and not known what to do, patriarchy, but also, yes and rules, to the fact that it's difficult for a lot of us to understand emotions and understand them when other people are having them around us. But when you have a patriarchal parent, that is a parent invested in all of these same rigid expectations. You can have single moms raising little boys that are even more strict, even more domineering, even more you're going to be a man than a father would be. We are not absolved from this just because of our hormones and genitals, okay? If you're seeped in patriarchal thinking, it's likely to rear its head if you are not paying attention and 
understanding what parts work for you and what parts do not. See, I'm not out here trying to ban masculinity. You see this muscle tee? You see these muscles? I love masculine. <laughs> homeboy and homies or in the case of this video because i am not on my home channel hey nieces nephews and nibblings hey <laughs> i just wanted to pop in today to further complicate some of the benefits some of the challenges and really some of the risks associated with men embracing femininity at varying degrees and varying levels in a femphobic society because we are creating a new era of masculinity and it's a beautiful one, but it is not without consequence. And I do think there is great risk, right? But there's also great reward for creating a world and a community, a community environment for men to embrace femininity however it feels most authentic to them without being shamed. But before we get to the positives, let's talk about some of the risks. I think men risk losing desirability risk losing perceived worthiness and valuability but also as you embrace femininity people in society will strip masculinity from you and we exist in a society where masculinity particularly for men is inextricably linked to humanity right? and i spoke about this before in the other video that i did um drake and the rise of sassy black men but i want to expound on it just a little bit more. America is a white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal, Christian nation. And it's important to note the Christian piece because the tentacles of fundamentalist white Christian indoctrination are very fucking long, okay? So long that even those folk who don't identify as Christian but exist in this society are still affected by that indoctrination, right? Because it's, it's socio-psychological. Right. And by that, I mean, it infects and impacts all of our minds and the way that we engage because it's inescapable. The ideas around masculinity and femininity are woven into the fabric of American society. Boys don't cry. Boys wear blue. Girls wear pink. And there's a lot of social correction for people who disrupt that white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal Christian idea of male masculinity, you know, female femininity and all oh, girl intersex folk just don't exist within this paradigm. And just to go a little bit deeper on this, because within Christianity and, and in particular white supremacist capitalist Christianity, it's understood that not only is God masculine, but in essence, so is everyone else. So is the rest of humanity. And follow me, right? Obviously we know God created Adam first and from Adam he created Eve, right? And so her existence is only by virtue of a man. Whenever the Bible refers to the entirety of humanity, it's always man. God so loved man and brrrah. Man, 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 man. Man. But even outside of the biblical context, because we live in this system, whether we're actually in the Christian faith or not, like I said, we refer to humanity and all of humanity as mankind, never womankind. Masculine identity is our pseudo objective identity for humanity, right? It is our go to gender. And I think this is an unconscious truth that we all understand. As men, we're acutely aware of that. We are acutely aware of what that means and how the power you wield in a male body is contingent upon really your masculinity, among other things, but largely <laughs> your masculinity. And even before we begin to understand the misogyny, the femphobia and the queerphobia that undergirds the rearing of child boys, we all understand that the worst thing you can be as a young boy and an adult man is feminine is soft. And this truth compounds on itself at the intersection of race and sexual orientation. And it, I think it becomes really volatile when we start to look at how this engages with blackness. You're sitting at the intersection of being a racialized person of color um, and also a man and you drop femininity in that bucket, things get tricky. And that's not to say being white and feminine and male is necessarily celebrated everywhere or exalted or embraced by everyone all, all throughout the society, no. But it is to say that hypermasculinity is not a prerequisite for worthiness, for acceptance, and for access to love, care, and safety um, in the ways that it is for men of 
color. I did read studies show that Asian men are deemed the least attractive on dating apps and that's because in large part due to their the perception of their femininity. And the same study goes on to say that further work on same sex pairing suggests that gay men also subscribe to the racial and gender hierarchies that they view Asian men as more feminine than other men. And I think this just furthers the point that we're all participating and engaging with this hierarchy of you know femininity and desirability on the basis of features gender hue body size when we look at the queer community specifically it becomes a little bit more nuanced right and it's why a there's a viral sound right now on tiktok how does it feel to be a six foot bottom how does it feel being a six foot bottom built <laughs> And that gets to be a read, right? Because there's a perception that we have when you are a certain height, a certain hue, a certain size, a certain shape, a certain race with certain features that you are to be more masculine. And I think that it's particularly sad in the queer community where we should be more imaginative when it comes to constructing relationships, particularly for Latin and black men with a special emphasis on black men, it's because we're indoctrinated into a kind of hardness, right? We're indoctrinated into a kind of machismo. <laughs> I had to say that with an X thing. Right, and that reminds us that in order to be desirable, in order to be worthy, you must be a brute. You must be <laughs> But all black men, cis, straight, queer, trans, and even folk who are operating in male bodies who are non-binary. We know this. We know what we're risking by embracing the feminine. And whether that's something as simple as a black man sharing his skincare routine and the day in the life content and getting comments like, bring real black men back. Yo, granddaddy wouldn't have did this. This new batch of men is different, right? And I think those kind of comments discourage men from building community and building community around something different or, or expressing interest in something that isn't the hyper-masculine, emotionally distant, stoic, tasteless, you know, archetype, right? It, it stops men from expanding and from growing and from exploring. And I just feel like men have so much more to offer. In this same article that I quoted earlier, Faith says, much of what can be viewed as the soft boy or the clean man aesthetic is constantly called out online and in online comments as pandering or being solely for the ladies. Primarily ascribed to the music from the LL Cool J's, the Drake's of the world, creative content that is classified as for the ladies usually precludes other men from publicly liking or affiliating themselves with that content. This is partly due to the desired audience, but secondarily due to a certain sexist disregard that comes with the content geared toward women's visual and visible pleasure. She goes on to say, I think it's also a sign that men are evolving, even in the face of so much media and public perception that says otherwise. And whether it's for the ladies or for themselves, this evolution should be celebrated and not ridiculed, especially as we move into an era where people seek a whole person instead of a better half. It is heartening to see representations of men and masculine identified folk embracing activities and ideologies that are not always coded as such, primarily because it's been too long and also because it's about damn time. And I feel like I keep talking about this through the lens of femininity, of love, intimacy, and self-esteem because so often when we talk about the needs of black people and in particular black men, we talk about them from a basic perspective, right? We talk about them from the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And if you're unfamiliar, I'll just put it right there on the screen so that you can see as well. It's always from a space of survival, but black men deserve to thrive. And a part of that thriving means achieving happier, healthier relationships. A part of that thriving means creating spaces for true freedom, freedom to feel, freedom to create, freedom to produce on your own terms, and freedom to live a gentler, softer male experience. This perspective invites the idea that men too sometimes need to be held, they need to be heard, and they need to be listened to. If we can create the kind of spaces and affirm a softer life for men, a more, a new era of masculinity where men are embracing more feminine activities, then we can create a strong community that enables men to achieve self-actualization, right? So to where a whole person is who you are engaging with as a person who's attracted to masculine identified men. I don't know. I think more men would be able to achieve their fullest, most authentic selves if the boundaries around masculinity opened up just a lot of bit just a lot of bit right black boys are required to be rough and tough to suck up the pain and not shed a tear if you get into a fight you better win the fight i'm gonna beat your ass when you get home it's a phrase i've heard too many times from friends and family throughout my life
As men in a white supremacist patriarchal society, our masculinity is always directly tied to violence, right? Like to be a man in this society means to have the capacity for um, and the capacity to enact immense violence and do immense harm to people stronger than you and, and definitely, definitely to those weaker than you. And this kind of hyper-masculinity isn't unique to black men or men of color. I think it's a colonized understanding, a, a vestige of manifest destiny, right? But I think for black boys who come from black men, who come from black men, who come from sons of formerly enslaved men, we understand that manhood um, and masculinity is not something that we should have access to, right? All of the perceived respect and power and privilege that comes with being a man, we are not supposed to have access to that and we understand that. And so the rules of engagement change. In order to be a man, a real man in the black community, you have to be twice as violent, twice as aggressive, twice as harmful in order to be half the man half the human. Our response to this socialization, though it is birthed from poverty, depravity, desperation, is always gonna be morphed into an issue of morality and bestiality. However, men embracing a soft life is an opportunity to escape that black male beast narrative. In the same way that women embracing a soft life is a way for them to escape the strong black woman narrative. And so what we're all searching for is humanity. What we're all searching for is authenticity, rest, respite, and just to at least be that last little piece of shit. <laughs> Men can cook, can clean, can meditate, can cry, can emote, can communicate, can increase their emotional intelligence. But most of all, and I think most important, men can express that they too do not dream of labor. Thank you all for having me. It's been rad. I've got to get out of here. I might have overstayed my welcome. Thank you so much, Khadija, for having me and inviting me on your channel. I hope I didn't bring too much ghetto to the place. I will not leave you all without saying what I say to all the people that I engage with. I am in a constant state of practice, and so are you. You can never fail when you're in a constant state of practice. Peace. My name is Luke. I'm 20 years old. You can call me David or you can call me Zadsman. My name is Giacomo Campbell, age 22. Uh, my name is Colin Wilson and I am 36 years old. Hello, my name is John D. Ruddy and I am 34 years old. Uh, my name is Guillaume Douay and I'm 32. You said before you described yourself as being soft growing up. What kind of traits would you describe a soft boy to have? I would say something typically feminine, like understanding, caring. I was always the one trying to protect the, I would say the weak, for lack of better word. Do you feel like there are personality traits attributed to men and masculinity that you identify with? The independence came from uh, the fact that I thought my parents would not love me anymore. So I was like, okay, you need to rely on yourself and yourself wow. alone. It was the day I helped myself on the chair. It was a whole chair in the whole house. And I sat on it and it broke under my weight. And then I hurt my back and I stopped crying because yeah, you hurt. But my dad told me something along the lines of, you cry all the time. You need to stop crying. You're a man. And I was like, oh, mm. okay. Would you say that that's uh, something that's always been the case for you growing up as well? Like when you were younger, did you tend to have more women friends? Uh, so I grew up, um, so I grew up in Ireland. Growing up, you kind of felt like, oh, well, you know, I should be, you know, hanging out with the boys. And But they all played football and soccer. And I was just was not my thing I, I tried i tried to get into it i just i just, I just couldn't do it um, and i hated it are there stereotypical male masculine traits that you've been told over time that you identify with in like a positive way like you're like yeah this is like i, I vibe with that this is cool mm -hmm. this is cool yeah i mean i like in general i'm a very competitive person were there certain masculine traits that you were told or gently told about that fit your personality and were there ones that don't in, in terms of like competitiveness and independence the way it was sort of like framed and because like 
again, like I used to play sports, like it'll always be framed in kind of like that context. Mm. Though when I was playing sports, like just because like you're playing with other guys, it would come off as very masculine. But at the same time, it's, you know, there was nothing really that I ascribe to that to masculinity. So I think growing up, I kind of had that experience of, you know, like, don't cry and like, you know, hold it in, whatever you're feeling, just kind of tamp it down and don't, don't be too expressive with it. And I did not fit that very well. That was like a hard part of growing up was like being someone that would like cry and then being, you know, like looked down on for that. I guess, what are the masculine traits that were prescribed to you that you say you identify with that you think are positive? You know, people talk about positive masculinity a lot. Like on a surface level, strength, like yeah. physical strength. <laughs> are there certain traits on that masculinity spectrum that you were maybe told you should have or you kind of got the vibe you should have that didn't fit? I mean, sportiness or, th or that kind of general yeah. um, push to like, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't understand it. I still, mm -hmm. I still don't understand. And I mean, I was always a bit more of a uh, emotional child. And yet at the same time, I did have an aggressive streak. Okay. Um, but it was always, it was something that I had learned to to very much hide because when I was very young, when I when I would lash out, when I would lose my temper, I it, it was like incredible Hulk kind of just rage monster. And it was very funny to perceive, apparently. Laughter and a temper is like pouring gasoline on the fire. Do you think the soft boy is on the rise? I don't like categorizing people into like mm -hmm. just a specific archetype. Like, I think that kind of like almost dehumanizes people. Cause I mean, all men feel like soft emotions. All men feel strong emotions. I think that men are becoming more comfortable with expressing or recognizing that they have emotions that would be typically considered like soft or vulnerable. But I don't think that like the quote unquote soft boy is like taking over men. I guess I don't know. I'm, I'm not really keeping tabs on the soft boys, um, but uh, much love and much support to all my softies out there. Um, yeah. Any sort of any sort of expression of masculinity, as long as it's healthy and fine. Like I've known like a lot. Of, I've known guys who are can come off like soft or quote unquote more effeminate than other guys, but like I don't see them as any less of a man or any less masculine than you know the big tough. You know, I spend all my day in the gym stereotype. I Do you think that we're living in a time period that's allowing more and more boys and men to have softer expressions of themselves? Absolutely, yeah. And it's, um, I'm all for it. I could even spe be speaking to other men about this, where it's just, even if they feel it, that it's an affront to their own expression of masculinity or that they feel threatened somehow. I can very easily just talk them out of it. They can still express themselves in their own way. Like mm. you still have these this variety of different modes to get yourself across. We're just adding more colors to the palette, essentially. More and more people don't have to just dull down or just whitewash parts of themselves, like mm. fully for it. Like being gender critical. Yeah. Is has opened a lot of people up to reintegrating those traits that would be more commonly described as feminine into into themselves even even if you do identify as a man like realizing yeah. that realizing that you're not locked into only masculine traits and yeah and certainly in you know my my immediate kind of groups of close friends and even kind of peripheral friends beyond that you know there is certainly uh a, 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 i would think a healthy view of you know emotional openness you know do you think we're in a time period now where more boys are growing up feeling comfortable 
to be more emotional, to be a bit more quote unquote soft? Yes and no. Social media uh, help us see more people vulnerable, being more soft. But I still hear from younger generations. Uh, I hear stories that I I lived, you know, mm. the the dumb, I would say, joke boy bragging about an exploit that is not even an exploit, and everybody's following him. Last question: Do you have any? words of wisdom or encouragement to your fellow dude friends out there uh, number one tip would just like absolutely have to be emotional intelligence mm. like just like foster emotional intelligence in some way i'm gonna i'm gonna borrow something that we talk about in in my men's group okay. um and that's relax open connect roc find at least someone that you can be absolutely emotionally vulnerable with. Mm. And it's like a muscle that you need to keep exercising. And the more you do, the better you get at it. Do what you have to do to survive, but don't cut this softness too deep inside of you. How many times do I say at the end of the day, at the beginning of the closing remarks? But at the end of the day, the archetypes that I discussed at the beginning of the video, I'm sure there are men out there that relate to some of the attributes. But like I said, I think most times it's just the media and creative folks online coming up with ways to describe people that are specific enough for folks to relate to, but vague enough for a lot of folks to relate to, you know, it's like Myers-Briggs or your love languages or anything or horoscopes or even religion. We all believe stuff and cool. Where it's not cool is when we limit people to those archetypes. And just as I think it's uncool to limit men to the himbo, soy boy, soft boy archetypes. I also think it's a hindrance and damaging to understand them through nothing but a patriarchal lens. The personality trait of patriarchy to make it more digestible, one of domination, one of control, as we said, dominator model, this power play where the relationship is always, well, one person has to be in charge or one person has to be on top, you know, like, and if it's not gonna be me, then who's it gonna be? What about a partnered model? Where that goes back and forth. And I'm not trying to tell people how to live their lives or their relationships. There are some people that love every aspect of what patriarchal personality traits, thinking, identify completely with what we've decided are only masculine traits. Cool. If that's you, that's cool. But that's not everyone. And to force men to only be one way, whether that's the patriarch, the man, or they need to be softer, they need to be more, you know, it, to do any of that is so silly, y'all. And a cop out with having to actually speak to men and hear what they have to say about themselves. Ooh! At the end of the day, archetypes like this should be fun and hilarious. And I think for the most part, a lot of the, the queer creatives online making these fan videos of Pedro Pascal being baby girl or Kendall Roy or Love and Cronk, you know, like it's just, we understand the silliness of it. And, and it's just for fun. It really is just for fun. But patriarchy, I don't know. Patriarchy doesn't, doesn't seem fun. It's not giving the same amount of fun. It's not giving the same amount of playfulness and exploration, you know? Yes, those archetypes are limiting, but they're not meant to define men and keep them in those boxes. They're for fun. If you're a dude watching this, I come in peace. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> so, um, thanks for watching. Thanks, yeah, there's like 12% of you. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed hearing from fellow dude friends. Um, let us know what's the vibe, what's the deal. Uh, uh, me trying to talk 
to, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I talk to men. One of my besties is a man and he's straight. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Be sure to let me know your thoughts below. If you wanna join my Patreon, feel free to. If you wanna get some merch, feel free to. If you wanna just leave a comment, engagement, donation, please feel free to. As always, be sure to feed your plets, water your plets, and remember that you can always change your mind because you can, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Oh, finally. I oh, I don't get paid enough for this. Shucker, I think your mic is- Can you, can you believe people actually Shucker, believe I believe stuff? your mic is- This is insane. This is so okay. stupid. Uh. I think maybe I'm just too far away from the light. Maybe that's what it is. Sorry, my sister just texted me something that's required I bring a swimsuit something in a water bottle and I'm like, what the fuck am I supposed to be doing? You know what it is? It's the window. Khadija! I need to block out the lights. Out one more door. I don't wanna hurt. This is the Broadway version. I don't wanna hurt anymore. Stay in my, oh, my arms if you dare. Or must I imagine that? Don't walk away from me. Okay, I'm gonna try this again, less seductive. Okay, because I don't know why I'm trying to seduce the audience. God damn it, one more time. So in order to, oh my God, why can't I speak today? Okay. In the new patronage ditch, in the new patronage, in the new patronage diction. Oh my fucking, here we go again. Here we fucking go again. Whoo, I'm about to get mad. Okay. Is it the bang? Oh, there it is. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Y'all recognize this damn wig? Okay. Okay. <laughs> this damn wig, this whole outfit. Oh, let me take this off. This dress, this lipstick. Oh my God, I need to get out of these clothes. Thank you so, so much to Noah for adding his photo. <laughs> Our, the, the leader, the leader of the soy boys. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to Shan Spear for agreeing to do these random sketches with me um, and for bringing, I'm sorry, Shucker, for joining us. Thanks to all of the dudes that I interviewed. And thanks to y'all for watching. We're gonna go into the closing remarks cause I'm in a different outfit. I actually shot the closing remarks separate. Um, but I just wanted to give this quick thank you to everybody involved and take off that damn wig. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> closing remarks time. <laughs>